Hey everyone, it's Jim. How are you? Hello, Jim. Doing good. Hope you are too. Yep. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hey, Jaya. I think we had Oz on, but he dropped, yeah. probably rejoining. Hmm. Gus, I don't recall you on our previous calls. Um, are you with the same team as Jaya and Oz and others or with a different team? I uh, Yes, I was. Um, actually, the last call was my first one. And oh, uh, okay. I'm on uh, Jaya's team. That's, that's right. Great. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Nice to meet you, too. All right, so I'm not sure if um, it's Robert's joining, not sure if Erica is, I know she set up the meeting for us, but not sure if she's able to make it so we can get started in a minute or so if she's not here. Okay, um, so I know there were some comments on the document itself. Maybe we can just quickly browse through those and see if there's some worth discussing. And then we'll look at, um, so I have the CRDs drafted um, and, and uh, just a very simple example we can look at inside a cluster. And um, we can talk about you know next steps and what we need to do to get the, like a PR in and get this into the repo. All right, so let me share my screen. I'll just pull up the doc. Uh, if anybody needs the link, I'll also paste that in the chat for us. Yep. <laughs> See, there it is. Okay. So let's just go back up top and see what's left to be addressed. Um, so I think, Robert, this was a comment that you had added. Do you want to kind of walk us through? Uh, it's kind of hard to see. Let's see. This is talking so about events. Yeah, I think I was just commenting on the, the definition of where state lies. So is the state of the underlying system or state of the violation or you know, what. So I think this is more commentary than a particular uh, okay. suggestion. Okay. So, sorry, like I said, it's kind of, I'm kind of on a small phone screen. So oh, okay. No worries. Okay, yeah, it's so just kind of scanning through it. Yeah, it's talking about state transitions and I guess the idea is to record um, some of these states, right? So here we're interested in policy results, obviously, as a state. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, then I think we were talking about audit logs. And also, I think, Robert, this one's from you too, which is talking about, yeah, audit logs serve a different purpose. That's correct. Um, yeah, so I think the idea, okay. we shouldn't, we shouldn't be intertwining policy results with an audit log. I think you know, right, in, some, right. in some sense, those are totally distinct concerns. I agreed. Here, I, I guess I was trying to, um, you know, at one point, if you recall, there was a discussion of should we be using the, um, if there's flexibility or a proposal to provide more flexibility into the um, audit policy uh, and allow multiple sources of writing to the audit logs, would that make sense to put policy results there? But I, I you know, perhaps uh, as just as another output stream, but I don't think it replaces what we're, or it doesn't overlap with having a policy report. And I think that's what you were mentioning here too. 
Yeah, and I think I've I've probably gone back and forth myself on that, and I think I've, I've come back to where you originally were, Jim, and that you know, as an as a convenient mechanism, I think we were looking at the SIGOTH op opportunity, but when you take a step back and say, where does this logically belong for me? It, it doesn't really belong in the audit lock. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Multi-tenancy, that was your next comment, Robert. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting one. And that's where I think um, the custom resource we want to allow both that cluster scope as well as namespace scope. Uh, to make it possible to report uh, violations for namespace owners if they don't have access to cluster resources. So that's one, one um, provision for multi-tenancy. I don't know if there's any other things we could do. Um, and of course, if there's sensitive data that we don't want to display, then it would, should be shown at cluster scope and role bindings, et cetera, need to be configured accordingly. Yeah, and that does bring up another issue, and that's that's a real world issue. And that some of the projects I've been involved with, um, you know, you, you talk about compliance issues, the decision logs, or you know, in this case, a policy uh, violation report. If there's sensitive data in there, that becomes a problem. Right. Um, you know, either in terms of you know additional controls that are required around that data, or in case of like GDPR and such there's data about a particular user in there, then, then how does that work? And how do you get rid of it? Right. You to... Yeah, so this, uh, of course, what we would um, want to, and perhaps it's worthy of noting somewhere, either in documentation or even in comments that proper role bindings and roles should be created to access these CRs, right? Because uh, there will be information just like with other cluster information, uh, there's potential um, data which could, you know, which could, uh, I guess, be considered in a, under privacy laws, right? Like usernames and things, or even just system names, things like that, which uh, may be considered sensitive. but I don't see it as any different from some of the other data that you would find inside a cluster, as long as there's proper role bindings and access controls. Seems like that would be the right way to manage that, the scope of uh, visibility. Um, I guess the only, the only real world use case I'll speak to is, um, and again, I don't wanna derail the whole topic, so I'll just leave with this. You know, you have a case of, say, you're a media company, you're using, you know, this for your compliance and you're trying to prevent, I, I'm just saying, like data loss, right? So the compliance violation is a case where some end user's personal information is found in the wrong place. If you log that sure. end user's personal information in the compliance report or the violation report, that then itself propagates the sensitive information and now has to be purged and controlled and what have you. Right. You know, so that, that data, kind of, there has to be some way, I think, to not just roll back our back control over who can see the, but what data goes in there. So like, is right. it essential that you put that PHI in there or can you actually address the violation without that PHI, which would be a, a better, uh, less, uh -huh difficult uh, thing to control. Anyway, True. So I'll, I'll off on a tangent, so I'll stop there. No, I, th I think this is a very valid comment, right, uh, Robert? I think um, maybe like Jim, you were saying, we need to include some guidelines on the kinds of data that, uh, because th there are some free form fields in the schema, right? Uh -huh. And so putting those guidelines in so that um, considerations for GDPR and those kinds of things should be right. in place, right? Would be important, I agree. Okay. Yeah, certainly that's something we can add to the docs and enhance and uh, both for multi-tenancy as well as, um, you know, just uh, keeping compliant with uh, privacy laws. All right, uh, sounds good. 
So the uh, on the structure itself, uh, so let's see what this is referencing. Yes, so the sentence you write, it, it does talk more about violations. So policy report must uh, provide actionable information on current violations for the scope. So I thought that was important to call out though, because violations and failures are probably one of the primary use case. I mean, yes, uh, there are potentially others, but um, at least, you know, we want to make sure that if a failure is reported, there's enough information about which object um, and, you know, which policy and rule and how to remediate, right? Sure. So I guess it's just the action, action information is kind of optional. It's, well, I guess it's more of a, uh, a variant, if you will. It's a, if it's, if it's a violation, it's probably more required, but if it's a in compliance report, then it's probably optional. Right. Yeah, so these seem like, you know, the, I guess I'm just making a note, these seem like good guidelines for engines, you know, to, um, you know, we talked about multi-tenancy, about privacy, and even, you know, making at least the failures actionable, right? So an admin can knows what to resolve and how to resolve it. Okay. All right. Uh, so then the definition itself, I see here. Um, hey Jim, um, yeah. Uh, you who's on the call from my team uh, has to drop in a little bit. Okay. Can okay. we process his comments first? Yes, absolutely. You were there some in the document you want to call out or? Yeah, here. So the yeah. first I put it there is basically like, how do we want to handle the uh, the the result? Uh, right. The the result, like for example, the current report shows the the latest status, the latest result. Like uh, like e <coughs> uh, What if like uh, we want to? So do we, do we plan to just generate multiple reports for each execution, and then that represent a history yeah. and a trend, or? I think. I think personally, one thing we've kind of, after thinking about this over the years, is that Kubernetes, especially when you're dealing with things in the like resource, it's not built to handle a history. You, it can re represent what is going on right now in the cluster, in the state, and what can be then remedied. But any sort of historical analysis needs to be pushed to a different system. And we'd leave Kubernetes and those resources as representing the state of the cluster right now. That's kind of more of a thing that is just because of the, how Kubernetes you know, resources in the model of it rather than something specific to policy. That's my stance. Etcd is not going to work well if you're trying to keep right. a history. Yeah, so certainly, and I think there's some balance to be found, right? Where, um, I mean, there are there are examples where some historical data gets stuffed into like metadata and other fields, which is not always best, but it's, you know, it's there. Um, uh, so I think I totally agree with what you're saying, Erica, in terms of mostly we want to report on current state and guide administrators in terms of what they need to remediate, what problems exist. However, there's nothing in the CR that prevents, uh, you know, I think for what you is asking, if, um, if you want to create some multiple instances and maybe if a policy engine has a retention, um, you know, period or something like that, now, obviously this would, you know, you would want to say like, okay, I'm going to keep maybe the last three instances and do this on a daily basis or something like that. So we're not specifying or dictating the period or the retention um, over here. Again, these could be guidances to, you know, when we could state what Erica just mentioned that the idea is for current results, but it makes sense if, if the if some upstream management system is, let's say, retrieving information once every hour, 
you want to make sure at least you've covered like your hours worth of retention, right? So something reasonable like that would, would make sense to perhaps uh, Like document. for example, if you have a policy resort that shows a violation because of some pod that's running something it shouldn't be or whatever, and that pod gets deleted, having the policy results a lot around still that was the violation isn't, you know, all of a sudden it becomes not as useful. It's, oh, did you keep the information? What pod? Well, the pods changed. I think the policy result needs to change somewhat in a best case reconciliation loop in a similar way. And just like if you do need that kind of audit information of, for that pod, you need to kind of have an event stream right. pushed for the policy results itself. It, so kind of on a, this is what you're, to the best effect of the policy engine, this is the state of the cluster. That, does that make sense? Rather than thinking too much about retention, it's, this is our best, most recent attempt to give you the state of the cluster in terms of its policy. Yeah, so, so what, what do these fields mean? I mean, the, I see a last execution and execution count. Yeah, so that um, the, and this is, you know, something actually that I, um, but I was trying out the custom resource. I went with a different approach because it already has a creation timestamp. I removed these fields in the custom resource, but the intent was to show when this report was generated. Um, so really it was more about a timestamp. And the count was if we want to keep a record of how many times the policy has been scanned or applied um, on the resources. Okay, so because, for example, in our concept, right, we have a policy controller that will process the policy against the control and it, is, it can be configured to run every so often. And so if it runs like three times a day, then the execution count will show three and the last execution will be the last time it was executed. Is that, is that what it is? That's exactly right. So, and, and of course, if the policy engine keeps, you know, let's say reports up to one day or one hour or, you know, in addition to the current, then it would have to, the ex the last, execution or the creation date of the resource would tell us which one's the latest. So it will basically create multiple policy report instances, right? It's possible. We're not, we're not um, yeah. preventing that, but to Erica's point, I think we should have yeah. some guidelines on what, on how to get to the most current. So it's very easy for admins to see the current state, right? Cause that's the main, main thing we want to help yeah. with. Yeah, the reason we, we are bringing this up is because we have heard some feedback from customers that they would like to see the historical sure. uh, trend of things so that they can know if something is going wrong, right, on their yeah. management. So that no, they can do RCA. It totally makes, makes sense. And I think even uh, we can look at metrics as an example, right? Prometheus inside the cluster typically keeps some amount of very, very limited history, right? Like 15 minutes yeah. or something by default. But of course, everybody wants metrics for the last month, last year. So you would push that into a management cluster or some other management tool offline, or that tool will pull the data um, through events or through other mechanisms, and you can have long-term storage there. Okay. I, I, think, I think we get the idea. And I understand Erica's uh, concern and shared that. So I, th I think- that so brings up a good yeah. point. Like, I think we- uh, way back a couple of years ago when uh, we were helping my intern build the container scanning operator thing, I think we pushed Prometheus metrics for it. And that was like a really cheap way to kind of get a history of the yep. policy violations. I don't know if it still does that. Um, but we could talk about like standardizing on that. Like we recommend you push your controller also pushes these violations to like Prometheus using the same kind of format or something. Yeah, yeah, we can we can take that offline and if necessary, come bring it back here. Um, because we do have a observability component that we will be integrating with as well, which is going to be collecting metrics and such. So, um, so that's good. Okay. 
Are you? I don't know whether you dropped or he's still around. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm still here. Yeah. The other thing is, is is like uh, we do want to provide uh, some kind of uh, UIL. Uh, for example, one use case is like we have a controller that generates uh, that scans image vulnerability, and then once there's a vulnerability, it it will generate uh, a, a custom CR. A C, it's a CRD. Uh, uh, it is. It will be named as uh, as a image char, the char of the image, and in that CR, it contains some uh, detailed information like what vulnerability exists in uh -huh. this in this uh, in this image. But today, in t uh, in today's report, we only show some summary information like you have violation, uh, you have a you have failed the policy. So uh -huh. currently, the structure doesn't allow us to provide deep linking into the the details uh, of the violation. Right. So, so the yeah, there would be a status um, and some summary data. I think if you need any other custom data that would you know belong in the data field, uh, at least in the structure right now, where you can put any any links, any additional information you would require. Um, and you can also use, for example, if you want to point to a particular pod as that source, of course, you can use either the resource um, or if the, viol if the entire report is, uh, you know, just for one violation, you can use the scope to point to that particular object. So there's some flexibility there, but yes, it would, it would end up being like just generic data in this map, uh, a string string map where you can store additional fields like that. Ignore my ignorance on the implementation details, but it, architecturally, it might be nice to have other uh, components decorate these results with that kind of more detailed information. Is that, is that a, uh, supported? Is that a pattern that's used? So we, you know, you, the, the policy engine creates a resource uh, mm -hmm. for the violation, and then some downstream system can, can annotate or decorate Annotate is a bad word, given that it has annotation meaning. But add data to the to the fields to enhance the report. We the first version did use annotations, I think, on the pods. But I think one of the things maybe is this brought up somewhere else. The problem with, for instance, the vul container vulnerability using you can't put them all in one policy report, right? You can't link to every single pod necessarily you might have thousands that are you know have its own vulnerability so i think that's why you know sometimes you need to then okay do you create you decide to create one per pod sort of or per image but then you know, trying to aggregate the results up maybe yeah that, this is always a weird one perhaps i'm wondering if in the um where we link to the resource, if we should kind of allow some kind of like label selector kind of thing or some other way to gather multiple resources in a way that doesn't require us to list them out. So in it, like instead of just having a data map like provide something like a selector which um yeah maybe we need some kind of selectors to select for large numbers of either sub which well, we can also note that a policy report can refer to other policy reports in its violation <laughs> right like, yeah, so there is some there is some uh, room for aggregation here, right? So you can, of course, you can have results which are referencing different uh, objects and perhaps even different rules, uh, if needed, right? Within the within the policy scope. Um, so in the case that you was describing, if it's an SHA, if it's like a SHA like uh, index or like a hash, how would you know? That's not that would not or that's another custom resource in the system. So if you want to reference it as a resource here, you could, but yeah, to your point, Erica, if you want to, you know, just reference 
all of those, right? To say that, hey, we're, we're just saying that there's more than one uh, image violation or an image of this type, because the same image could be used maybe in multiple pods and you don't want to reference each one separately, but you want to group them. Then yeah, labels is an interesting idea to just have a selector. So in that specific example, you are there some common selectors or labels that, that can be applied? Uh, currently, the current information for that operator, no. It's basically, it's, it's generating uh, multiple uh, CRs. It's generating, basically just, just generating multiple object, ob object of that custom resource. Um, okay. I think the concern here is that tools that are going to be processing this information, right? Information that is in the data area is not something that they can count on in the sense that, you know, they, it's pretty much, you know, very proprietary, right? Because we are not uh, speaking it out here. It's specific to an engine. Yes. Right. So, so I think what we are trying to do here is to say that uh, in the non-data field, which is more uh, strongly typed, even even some of that is optional, but at least it is kind of laid out. Mm -hmm. And um, so the tools that process can look for it. We want to make sure that the critical pieces are there, right? So, right. so the question here is, do we want, um, so the example that you is bringing up is is an example of a drill down, right? I mean, if I want, you know, if I get a policy report that represents a violation and I want to now drill down to get to details, um, what is the way I would do that, right? And is that going to be a first class concept in the schema or is that going to be hidden in the data area is, is the question. No, there is, there is a support of that through aggregation, at least to one level, right? So the example uh, that I was thinking about for multi-tenant environments, is let's say you have several, you know, workloads, several things in the namespace or a set of namespaces that belong to a tenant. You may want to create, you know, maybe one report per application, perhaps one report per namespace, or maybe even just one for the tenant. And um, the structure allows that just by, you know, saying, okay, what your scope of the report is and then what the results are. Now, what we haven't thought through, or at least I haven't uh, you know, thought through is if we want reports to be nested or reports to reference each other, how would we do that or support that? Um, in, again, in theory, you could, you, know, you could use the resource field to point to other sub-resources or even CRs uh, within the results map. So you, can we represent the, Image um, vulnerability CR details in the resource field here. Um, it's kind of hard because currently it's string string map, right? So it's just no. The value. resource field. The resource field is a object reference, so it would have name, kind, namespace. Oh, res resource, not results. Okay, I was I was talking about the data. Um, yeah, so the resource field, um, which I'm highlighting, that is uh, an object reference. The data is just for additional data, just like annotations, mm -hmm. right? Okay, I think as long as we can specify, like if it's a uh, namespace, the resource, then we can specify mm -hmm. namespace, name, and kind. Right. Yes. And we can specify multiple of them then this should be fine. So the multiple is goes back to what Erica was mentioning, then we should probably have a resource and a resource selector. And the, you know, I guess the Kubernetes way of doing multiple is through a selector. So then you would have to put a label and, um, you know, apply the right label selector over here. Okay. Okay. So if it's a single resource, we use resource. If it's multiple, we need to provide a, a label selector. Correct. So that okay. that could be a good solution to allow both. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. You did you have anything else? 
Um, no. Okay, feel free to drop. Um, so I think, thank you. And Gus, I think you had some comments, right? Yep, let's go back to... Um, yeah, so this, Gus, you're mentioning about multiple clusters in a single hub or I guess like a management cluster, like I was mentioning. Anything we could do to help with that in the structure? Or? Um, no, I, I really added that comment to, to basically poke my team to see if, um, if, if there was something additional we would need to handle that case. I, I think um, our management of um, you know, p policies that are you know, being distributed to multiple clusters are, are probably uh, kind of falling into this multi-tenant um, you know, uh, idea here. Uh, you know, it's just a, a, a different um, way of thinking about it. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to stick something in here in case uh, uh, we, we lost you. <laughs> he, was, he was the main one I was interested in, whether he had any comments on it. But um, okay. uh, I, I think um, there's nothing specific I, I know of that I feel like we, we need to add um, um, unless someone else from the team. So Gus, I thought that uh, what we wanted was to represent within the policy report schema, the identity of the cluster, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and, and that's what we do today, sort of through the, the, the namespaces uh, with, with policies. Um, if, if there's something extra that we want to try to add. Um, wait, 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 namespaces. Okay, so namespaces on the manage cluster they don't help us with uh, the identity of the managed cluster, right? No, no, I'm talking about namespaces on, on the, the hub cluster. Right, right, but the, but the policy report is coming from the managed cluster, right? So... It, it's, it's both, right? It, it, it would be in both places. So on, on the managed cluster, it would, it would exist. Um, as the namespaced resource or, or cluster scoped resource, depending upon what it's representing. But then on the hub cluster, it would always be the um, namespaced resource where the namespace is associated with the managed cluster. Right, so, so if there is a, and if I understand correctly, the hub cluster is what's um, querying all these managed clusters and pulling this information or somehow being sent events? Is, is that the model? Right. Okay. So then it should have the source information, right? So doesn't seem like we need to, I mean, yeah, I, I think it could be that if the managed, uh, if the hub cluster in your nomenclature is getting this information and if it's also storing these long-term, right, does it need to add or enrich this further and add some other information like to say which cluster it came from and um, where would, maybe that's what Jaya is thinking about, where would that go? So potentially that could go into, again, like the metadata, right, to say like source cluster or uh, manage cluster ID or however you want to r reference that. Right, yeah, so. That, that's what I was wondering yeah. if, if we yeah, would I would want. like to do that because I think uh, I think the way you know open cluster management slash Rackham is doing it is one way, right? And um, I think I want to kind of have this policy report independent of that, independent of how we represent things. Um, because I think this information could be consumed, obviously will be consumed by Rack, but it could also be consumed by other things, right? So, so I think uh, I think it's good to include the cluster identity into the policy report itself. 
so that you know if this information is also consumed by other tools, whether it is for metrics or other manageability tools, right? I think the way I would recommend it is that you have a, like what we want to make clear is that when you have references to objects, those should like direct um, object references. I think we, it would be kind of weird if those referenced things outside of the current cluster. Hmm. Do you have this, how do you handle, policy can't be the only place with multi-cluster where some of this comes up, but you're trying to reference or talk about objects that are in different clusters. Is this a common problem? Um, so yeah, I haven't seen any example where you're linking uh, or have pointers across clusters. Um, in, in the cluster API, in the CAPI stuff, everything that represents other cluster information like uh, clusters which are being provisioned and managed is stored as a CR in the management cluster itself. So yeah, in this case, if you're transferring this from one to another, right, like the object information, like the name, spaces, et cetera, wouldn't make sense in the hub cluster in 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 the nomenclature that Gus was using, but so it would have to be, somehow it would have to be tagged that, hey, this report came from some other cluster. So any object um, reference is referencing objects in that cluster. But Can we yeah, steal not sure. some kind of identifier then from one of those projects? Uh, and the other question is how much, like if I'm running a controller inside a cluster, do we have information? Like, I, I don't know, like through just the standard bootstrapping and APIs, can you get, I'm sure you can look up, of course, the API server IP address and things like that, but is that, that's not a immutable ID, right? So I don't know how we would reference these clusters from inside the cluster. Mm. So it almost seems to me that if there is again, some higher level management system, like in this case, the hub cluster, that should be responsible for um, transforming the data, enriching the data, if it's storing it in its database, right? Okay. Um, so it's so, retrieving it from the source, but at that point you can, you know, you can add additional metadata and update information before um, putting it into the hub cluster database. Okay. Yeah, because the hub hub knows where it's coming from is your point. Right. Right. Okay. okay. I think we'll live with that for this one. Um, okay. Go ahead, Gus. Did you have anything else? Great. Go and go in order or yeah, I can I can stay. I don't need to drop. Okay. Um, so I think there was yeah another. So Robert, you had a previous comment over here on the toll spec uh, status and design, and I tried to write that up in a better manner, like to describe what the difference here was and why we were deviating from that model. Not sure if you had a some time to take a look at that, if there's anything else we need to write over here, or if this seems. I'll take a look at it. I'll, I'll, I'll look at it after, okay. after the call and, uh, and close it okay. up. All right, uh, there's a comment from Mary with, on labels. So I think, um, so the question over here was, can can we do something like kubectl get policy report and then deployment my deployment? So and I, if I understood that correctly, it so it seems like I mean you can you can put labels on the policy report, so that should be possible. Um, is there anything else? And of course we have like also like things like the scope and resources, but the labels would be an easy way if if a policy is related to a particular resource um, that could be also added into the labels, but we're not, you know, we're not sort of mandating that or requiring that. Anyone have any other thoughts on this? Uh... Yeah. Well, I mean, in some sense, this is where 
the namespace uh, interacts with access control in a kind of way that Kubernetes is, not, is clunky about. Ideally, right, namespaces can literally group together things like your deployments and then your violations um, to help you find them. But at the same time, we probably want to be pretty strict of policy reports can be read by perhaps any user in the namespace, but only written by the tool. And the tool or the controller can only write but not read to keep it um, within a mandatory access control model. <laughs> So we can maybe specify a little bit more of what the um, RBAC by default right. sets up securely for one. Otherwise, I think the, you know, any people can label, labeling is really flexible and it's just whatever works best for you in your kind of system. Right, and right. If we really have specific labels that we know we need to kind of standardize across all distributions that's what we should talk about standardizing otherwise right. i think it's love to see people you know use labels to their best right yeah the one that i had suggested over years is that we have something called policy um you know under the policy group like just engine to say like who reported this right whether it's kubebench or kiverno or gatekeeper or rackham or something else Yeah, maybe I could see an engine and sort of a suite or some other kind of sort of versioning or something on it. But okay, yeah, I'm sure as we start using this in real world examples, we'll come up with uh, more more structure, more ways of tagging and classifying that that would make sense. Noticed we don't talk about um, owner references here. Yes. Um, so initially, when we were dealing with just violations, it was fairly straightforward to have an owner reference back to the object, right? That was um, creating the violation uh, or the policy rule. But now that we've moved into a more generic structure, yeah, there's no mention. I mean, it would be up to the engine. And potentially the engine's just recreating this report periodically, right? We're not really maintaining this. Uh, so, the, so the question you brought up in terms of um, what happens if I like, well, of course, if you delete the namespace that contains this report, the report will get deleted. But if you delete the pod or the workload, the report may not immediately get updated, but the next time it gets generated, the pod of course won't be referenced, right? There'll be a new set of results. Um, in that report. So, yeah, so I, I hadn't, uh, other than that, I'm not sure what else we would want to mention or how we would want to deal with, you know, if, if there's a need to have real time sort of updates, if you delete the pod, does it have to be, does the report have to be updated right away? Um, I don't think that's a strict requirement, but um, open to suggestions. Yeah, it doesn't seem like we have any thing that is specific to us, not the general problem. So I think we don't have to say anything specific. Okay. All right, uh, so moving further down. So Gus, you mentioned on... Yeah. Yeah, you already talked about URL sum. Um, there's certainly the drill down case, um, and and there could be other cases too. You know, uh, in in some cases, you know, it's probably fine that a annotation or or something could be created. Um, um, right. You know, it. it I wanted to call it out because it it was one of our first customer <laughs> requests when when they saw a, a, a similar framework. Um, 
the uh, you know your your engine label um, you know is going to reference in in some cases like you mentioned Kubench or or something you know that that has a you know specific home that could be linked to um, I don't I don't know uh, that it's worth defining a specific URL um, mm. that goes along with that um, I, I think the main discussion point was probably what you already covered um, you know related to the selectors and and that uh, uh, I forgot what the field was but <laughs> um, Okay. Yeah. So I think the prior discussion was on the resource selector. Um, so either having a single resource or a resource selector. And here, I think, yeah, this was on more the message. And I think you had a subsequent follow up comment on also severities, right? Right. I think, so this, I think this URL one, I think I, this makes sense. And I think I've seen this before. You often want like basically what's the authority on this thing and where is it defined when it's a external standard, right? For like, if there's a CVE report, you kind of want it linked to that. Is that kind of what they were asking for a little bit? Yeah, yeah. so there were uh, multiple different links they requested. Um, you know, one, one could be a link to, you know, the engine or, or the product that's generating the report because it, you know that product may have additional details uh, to provide. Um, of course, a link to like like your example, the CVE. So that's more specific to um, the particular um, security control that um, you know that you know, that that's been detected. Um, and uh, I, I guess the other link would would be maybe some some more general links on um you know it could could be like the link out to kubench or um you know some, something where there's some more general information on on you know the scope of the policy or something like that so there were there were three or four different little areas i, th I think where th they were wanting some more details um <laughs> that varied from policy level down to the results details. So, but could those be put into the data map as different fields or um, how would, you know, so obviously if you're looking at this in a product with a user interface uh, or a web interface or a console, then you would, you know, you expect those to be translated into links and things you could click on. But in, in terms of the raw data itself, um, I mean, With titles, yeah, that could be, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So every, every link here yeah, would have some kind of title or description that goes along with it properly. And um, it, um, yeah, so I was thinking that, uh, you know, the severity and the summary violation detail would be good to kind of bubble up about the data, right? The data could be more giving more details, et cetera, right? Because right now, you know, I had a question actually about this message. Um, the message field is a description of the benchmark or the policy. So, so it's basically a description of what is being checked, right? It is not a description of what was the result of the check. Because it looks like the only result we have is whether it passed or failed or warning or error or skip, right? Right. Yeah, so this is, this data information is intended, you know, and just that, uh, Look, at, I was looking at like output from tools again, like Kubebench and others, which were just showing a summary screen, right? And the idea would be, of course, you can click on each of these to get more details. And I think what we're discussing is where where are those details captured, right? Is it uh, back to the policy engine, or do we want to standardize on that next layer of details as well? So, yeah, I'm not 
Sure, and and there's no doubt that this information, like even categories and severities, is super important. Uh, that's definitely not the question. Um, the question is, do we need to standardize or try to standardize, attempt to standardize um, right away, or is this something you know, like as we talk about, you know, we had even uh, mentioned like the CVSS scoring and things like that. It seems like we could you know, as we get familiar with and look at tools which are using the structure, we will have a better sense for what to pull up and make top level fields. Yeah, I think um, from, uh, you know, given what we are working with is a management tool, anything that we show on our dashboard or exposed through APIs, we want it to be actionable, right? So in order to action on a violation, I think the first thing the ops team will need to know is how critical is this, uh -huh. right? So that is why I think the severity becomes important, right? Because otherwise you have, they wouldn't know which one to prioritize and action upon, right? Sure. So, right. So it seems to me that at least the severity is something we want to bubble up is what I would say. Right, but could uh, could it not be still used where the severity is in the data map? I mean, I mean you could. I think uh, my point more is that whatever is in the data map, I view as really not standardized because it is pretty free form and it's not spec'd out, right? So I think it's going to be hard for us to... Right. That's the, that's the challenge I'm facing because I think the way I look at it is, okay, so Rackham is managing a bunch of managed clusters. It's collecting all these details, right? And bringing it to the hub. And then it provides a way to action them, et cetera. But then in a real hybrid environment, I fully expect that customers would want to pull the data from Rackham and maybe feed it to something else, right? So, so think right. of it as, so, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense, right? And But the question is, is there a standardized way of reporting severity or a score or some other? Probably you know? several, right? We, maybe right. we should make our own, just add another. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know, like, and it just seems like a topic we would want to research and dive into a little bit deeper and then come up with some proposals if there's a way to standardize or even if you're dealing with multiple policy engines, one way of managing it is you look at the engine label and then based on that, you can expect certain fields in the data, right? So yes, it's freeform, but it could be that each engine publishes its subset of data, which, you know, just like with annotations, right? That's the approach people, folks have taken with annotations that if you're using, let's say some HCI, which has its own networking, it's expecting a, a certain set of annotations to be there to drive the configuration of that networking. So I don't see why it can't be used, even though it's you know put in data. It's just, is it worth trying to standardize at this point um, without sort of seeing that real world experience is my question. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. I think um, what I'm saying is we will definitely put that field right. in it, right? I think. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, and anyway, since we are going to be open sourcing uh, what we are doing, I think we can get feedback and evolve it and bring right. it back. That's fine. Okay, yeah, and this probably is the first thing once we, once we have this basic structure and I think the severity and scoring as you said, right, that's the first thing that our NOPS team would want to do is to say, okay, is this something that I should care about? And then uh, to Gus's point is like, what do I do about it, right? So give me a link I can click on to go read up yeah. on it and see what to do next, right? Those absolutely yeah. see, you know, the, uh, yeah. that's going to be required. So I think those two we will definitely add in the data field, the severity and the drill down link. Okay. Yeah, we should note, let's make sure also we're not, there's so much, obviously policies are rich subjects that 
Right. We don't have to put everything in here. And if we come and realize like there's actually a different new or another resource that would complement well, we can talk about that in the next, in another iteration too. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. I understand the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just like, I, I, just, I keep thinking of things I want to add into this resource. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Maybe I, I, I want to uh, step back. Yeah, trust me. You know, I worked on uh, some spec like this uh, ages ago on uh, a common event format, and uh, we had to be very careful on uh, right. <laughs> not making it too verbose, right? So, so I understand. Yep. Like. Ooh, maybe we should have like a, you know, a, a signed some, you know, so that we can verify the engine on the created this report. Or <laughs> so I think probably getting going too far here, but okay, yeah. So let's uh, let's you know kind of at least document that this is something that we intend to work on as a next step, but. Um, yeah. severities and then having these links because uh, both of those things would be important but we can revisit once we agree to the or get get the basic structure yep okay all right so I know we just have a few minutes left but really quickly wanted to show uh, what the CR is looking like and I do have a pretty straightforward um, so I just use Kube Builder for now, but I'm gonna, uh, before I submit the PR, I'll uh, clean this up. And I was thinking we could just use the, the, we don't really need a controller, so we can probably simplify what we actually need to maintain. Um, so I'll see what, how much of this stuff we can remove and just uh, keep the CRD generation portion off it that Kube Builder also uses underneath, right? So um, anyway, so the structure uh, is pretty much what we, what we have in the document. There were a few minor things I did, like I mentioned on the time and the counts, I just, I removed that because the, the creation time is just part of every resource. Uh, but we could, you know, we could go back and add things back. But this is what the result structure sort of looks like. So actually, I, I think I have an example. Yeah, I do. So just kind of playing around with examples. So if you look at, you know, from, um, and we could do this as minus over YAML. This is sort of what it would look like in the YAML, um, you know, where this is the results. And then there's a summary, which just has the counts there's a scope here in this report. Um, and then if you just look at it in the CLI um, without, so it would look something like this, right? So it's saying there's a report, uh, this is the scope of the report and it's showing some pass fail worn error skip and the age, which is from the creation timestamp. So yeah, nothing, uh, nothing too earth shattering, but looks, basically just taking. Looks good. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, is there a way to make it so that it's just like node slash Docker desktop the way they do for some of the other <laughs> printers? Yeah. That, would, that's my, that's my right. uh, so UI. Right, so unfortunately, but there's some limitations with this. Um, so right now the tool we're using. Key builder. Uh, yeah, is to um, and it uh, it uses a framework to generate CRs, right? So right. I couldn't find a way to do that, but that's uh, yeah, I was looking for that as well to see if we could combine the scope fields into one. Um, so we we'll, we can file a separate issue for that and see if there's a better way to manage. I also want to see like I don't know if anybody on the call has experience with this. I was trying to look for a tool to generate documentation. And there are some tools out there which can do that, but none of them seem to work um, with with uh, Kube Builder CRs. And there's open issues filed on Kube Builder v2 to you know in terms of how to generate documentation for API objects. So it'd be nice to you know whatever we have right now in the in the Google Doc to be able to automatically generate you know information like that and document the CR structure, right? So. I'll continue looking, but if anyone else has any experience on that, let me know. There are the tools 
specific to Kubernetes too, and they have, I think, and I'm not exactly sure what all of the Go auto doc kind of stuff they use is, but we'll be told and made to yeah. do it. So <laughs> I'm not too right. concerned. Yeah, so we'll have to, I think, before we, you know, go uh, and as we start, yeah, showing this to folks, I'm sure we'll have to figure out some way of doing that. So in first case, we'll have to write something that looks at the CRD and uh, just generate some simple markdown. Did you say that this is on GitHub yet? No, not yet. Um, so right now I just have this in my own repo, but I'll clean it up and submit a PR sure. probably you can later go ahead and week. push it push it now if you want earlier is okay we won't judge <laughs> okay yeah no I just wanted to find a way to remove all of this other fixtures we don't need um, from Kube Builder, right like with all the go types and controllers and things like that which um, so yeah I'll, I'll I should be able to at least submit the PR in the next day or so. Cool, ping us on Slack maybe uh, when okay. you do. All right, yeah, we'll do. Um, and again, examples would help. So if anyone has you know, other uh, additional examples, I know last time we had talked about uh, doing like two or three examples from Rackham and yeah. uh, other in tools. Fact, yeah, in fact, both you and Gus have done the examples. That's how we gave the feedback. So okay. do you want those put into this doc itself or how do you want to do it? Yeah, or just send them on the Slack channel or put them in the, or yeah, I guess you could add them in as a comment in the doc or just put them in the Slack channel and I'll add them to the doc. Um, I don't know if everybody on Slack, maybe just let me know if someone wants to write to the doc, I can give them write access because right now uh, it's like world readable and anyone can comment, but uh, not everybody can edit the doc. We can just add a comment, right, Gus? Yes, uh, uh, we can add comments. Okay. Okay, so we'll do that uh, later today. Okay. Okay. That'll be great. So, so the next step is uh, next week, there is a call. Is that right? Yes. So I don't know if we'll, it's a next week. I, my suggestion would be let's do another internal call, go through everything. Um, and we should have like the, the CR working by then, right? So we can try it out in different clusters. And, and then uh, if, you know, next week we'd also talked about potentially, uh, you know, presenting to SIG, um, say golf, right? Uh, we could do that next week, but it may be a little bit too too early. If um, if so, maybe we do that in their subsequent meeting, uh, if not next week. I would at least be in favor of, you know, even if it's not like presenting it as ta da here, like making sure that we are all, you know on the right track and in sync with them. I think uh, we don't want to. Yeah. We could give them delay. a quick update. Yeah. Okay. So is that is that called the same time or when is that called? It is uh, at do, 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 11 a.m. my time, specific time. Okay. So similarly, if, I think if you join, I will put in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, so under contact, if you join the mailing list. Okay, so so we will meet uh, next week the same time in this work group, and then uh, later that later that day is when the Zigot thing is right. Yes. Okay, got it. All right. Very good. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have Thank a good you. week. Thanks. Yeah. You too.